Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at a generic strategy for analyzing bias schemes for bipolar junction transistors that involved replacing all of the various bits of circuitry looking out of the transistor with Thevenin equivalents. Using the expressions of those Thevenin voltages and Thevenin resistances, we came up with something that we call the BJT bias equation that you could solve for the collector current. Then you could use these other relationships to compute the base current or the emitter current as needed. Now, if the expressions for the Thevenin voltages on the left here don't involve IC, we could readily solve this for IC and write an expression like this. And this is the case for the example we looked at in the last lecture, where you use a simple voltage divider in order to try to provide a bias voltage at the base here. And in this lecture, we're going to look at another strategy that's a bit more complicated to analyze called collector feedback biasing. The main change I'm going to make here is instead of taking the top of R1 and connecting it to the positive voltage supply, I'm going to connect it over here to the collector of the BJT. Another change I'm going to make is that I'm going to take V minus and set it equal to zero. And if you wanted to have some V minuses down here, this doesn't really change the analysis very much. You could imagine taking your V minuses and getting rid of them and just making something like say a V plus prime and setting that to V plus minus V minus, and then all of the various currents you derive would be the same, and you would just have to remember to shift back any voltages you compute. You would just use V plus prime in place of V plus in the various expressions. So this is, as mathematicians like to say, without loss of generality. So to plug in the appropriate quantities in this bias equation, we need to compute Thevenin equivalents looking out of the base and looking out of the emitter. Now, the computation of the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base is something that's quite a bit more complicated than anything else we've done so far in analyzing these kinds of circuits. So pay close attention here. When we compute the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base, we essentially cut the wire here so there's no current flowing through the base. And what we're going to do here is going to feel a little bit strange. We're going to use superposition. So we're going to use a superposition of two sources. One is the effect of the power supply V+, plus, but the other is the effect of this collector current, which I'm going to treat as an independent current source while computing the Thevenin equivalent. This feels weird. But if you remember the kind of arguments that Marshall Leach makes in his paper on superposition with dependent sources, this is okay to do as long as you don't actually try to solve for IC until you've included all of the effects involving IC. So in this first term, we're looking at the effect of V+. So we're going to deactivate this imaginary current source associated with IC, and when we do that, we zero it out, so we basically open that up. So there's no current flowing through the collector in this part of the analysis. All right, so then in terms of the voltage that we see at the base, remember when we're computing a Thevenin equivalent, we're assuming that no current is flowing through the base. Well, we just have a voltage divider. We add up all of the various resistances here where we have two parts of the divider. One of them we could imagine as a resistor that's RC plus R1. And I'm writing the parentheses here, even though I don't have to, to try to better keep track of things. And the other is this resistance R2. And we're dividing the voltage across R2. So R2 is going in the numerator. The thing that's a little bit more complicated to think about probably is thinking about the effect of this current source on the voltage at the base. So I'm going to imagine essentially zeroing out the positive supply here. So now if I think about this as a current source, I now have a current divider and I have two parts of that divider. One is a path that goes down RC and another is a path that goes down R1 plus R2. 
Now, I'm interested in the current flowing down that path. Let me call that I prime just to have something to call it. So to compute I prime by our usual current division rules, we need to put in the numerator the resistance that's part of the path that we're not analyzing. That's the resistor that the current we're interested in is not going down. And that is our C. So that goes in the numerator here. Now remember that the current I prime that's flowing down this direction is also the same as the current I prime that's flowing down here because no current is flowing through the base when we're computing the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the base. So the voltage at the base as a result of this current source here, well, by Ohm's law, that's just this I prime times this resistance R2, which is right here. So you might want to pause the video here, rewind it, and go through that derivation again because there's a lot of stuff going on there. Oh, one thing that I need to mention is why is there a minus sign here? Well, a quick way to think about whether there should be a plus or minus sign here when you're thinking about the effect of a current source on a particular node is to just look at the direction of the arrow. If the arrow is pointing towards the node, then you put a plus here. If the arrow is pointing away from the node, it's pulling current out of the node, then you put a minus here. And you don't have to think about it any further than that. So it's a bit easier to think about computing the Thevenin resistance looking out of the base, because then we just have a parallel combination of RC plus R1, these two resistors in series, with R2. So that's not nearly as difficult to think about. And the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the emitter is easy enough to think about. VEE is just zero, and REE is just this emitter resistor RE. All right, so if I take the various expressions up here and plug them into our BJT bias equation down here, I wind up with this long, messy equation here. Notice that I've written RBB up here instead of substituting it in here directly just to try to make everything fit on the slide. All right, so we need to solve this mess for IC. So we'll move all the terms with IC over to the right-hand side. And by all the terms, I really just mean this term. So this pops over here. So the minus here turns into a plus. I can then factor out all of the ICs on this side and then write IC equal the stuff on the left here divided by all the stuff that's left over after I factor out IC. So in this class, you'll see a lot of expressions that look like this, and they are big and messy and look intimidating, but they're really just algebra. You just figure out the numbers for your particular circuit and you plug them in. So if you look up collector feedback biasing on your Google machine, you'll probably see examples that don't have this resistor two here. And quite often what I'm calling R1, they'll call RB, but you can call that whatever you want. Anyway, let's explore the case where you don't have R2. So to take it out of the circuit, I'll take the formulas we've already derived and I'll just let R2 equal infinity. So if I do that, R2 goes away. And if I take the expression for RBB, well, any resistance in parallel with an infinite resistance is just that resistance. And then the way to think about this expression here is in terms of limits. So if you were to let R2 go to infinity, then eventually this constant here is going to be small relative to R2. And this whole expression here, this whole ratio goes to one. And similarly, leaving out this RC for a moment, if I look at this ratio here, R2 over all this stuff, Again, as I let R2 go to infinity, this ratio approaches one and I'm just left with RC. So this term here converges to RC. This term here converges to one as I let R2 go to infinity. And so I can simplify this IC expression and write it like this. Now to interpret this further, I find it convenient to take the numerator and the denominator and multiply both by beta. So I wind up with a beta in the numerator. And let's see, I have an RE1 plus beta, which I get here. And then RC appears a couple of times here, 
When I multiply the numerator and the denominator by beta, I wind up with a beta times RC here, and then I wind up with this RC by itself. So I can include this RC with the one plus beta factor. Anyway, taking this expression for the collector current and putting it at the top of the next slide, we can play some games by looking at some cases based on how we choose our resistances. So suppose we choose our resistors so that this R1 term here is negligible compared to the second term, the RC plus RE times the one plus beta. If that's the case, I can ignore R1 and write it something like this. So all I've done is I've dropped out R1. But now let's also assume that beta is big so that beta is approximately one plus beta. Well, if I do that, these factors here wind up canceling and I see is just the power supply minus my loss across the PN junction between the base and the emitter divided by RC plus RE. So quite importantly, if I've made this decision here in terms of my resistors, IC doesn't depend on beta anymore as long as it's big. And remember the name of the game in designing with BJTs is that beta is not a reliable parameter. You want your designs to be robust to changes in beta. You may recall that with our voltage divider example, we could achieve robustness with respect to changes in beta by choosing a sufficiently large emitter resistor. But notice here with the collector feedback biasing, there's nothing in here that really requires us to have an RE to achieve this robustness with respect to changes in beta. So you could let RE equal zero if you want. Now, as we'll see later in the class, there's reasons you might want to have an RE here, but you will often see people draw the circuit with this emitter hooked directly to ground. Now, all of our discussion so far has assumed that the BJT is operating in the active mode. It's a good idea to check that. The general strategy for doing so using this Thevenin equivalent approach is to check to make sure that the collector to base voltage is bigger than zero. That ensures that this PN junction here is reverse biased. And to do that, we can basically take our Thevenin voltages and subtract the voltage loss across the associated Thevenin resistances. Now, depending on your circumstance, instead of computing the voltage at the base from the point of view of the Thevenin equivalent of the base, it may be easier to compute it from the point of view of the Thevenin equivalent for the emitter, where you have to remember to add in this base emitter voltage here. We've already calculated most of the quantities we would need for such a calculation, except for the Thevenin voltage and Thevenin resistance associated with looking out of the collector. So let's do that now. The computation of the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking out of the collector is again pretty complicated, so watch closely. We will again use the idea of superposition. So here we're computing a Thevenin equivalent looking out of the collector, and when we do that, we imagine snipping the wire here so that no current is flowing through it. We'll use a superposition argument where we'll look at the power supply V plus, and we'll also treat the current flowing through the base as if it's an independent current source. Again, this feels kind of weird, but if we believe Marshall Leach's arguments, we can do this as long as we don't actually solve for IB until we've included all the contributions that involve it. So let's first focus on this V plus term. When I'm focusing on the V plus term, I imagine deactivating this theoretical IB source. So we open that up. And remember, we're computing the Thevenin equivalent looking out of the collector, so there's no current flowing through here either. So I just have a voltage divider. So I'm going to ask, what is the voltage at this terminal coming from V plus? So I'm going to sum up the resistances, put that in the denominator, and then I can think about putting in the numerator just the sum of these resistances acting as a single resistor. That's just those two resistances in series. And remember, I can do this this simply because I've deactivated this IB source, so there's no current flowing here when computing the contribution of E plus.
Now let's focus on the contribution of this theoretical IB current source. When I focus on its contribution using superposition, I want to zero out the V plus source. And now let me think about the effect of this current source on the voltage here at the collector using superposition. So I'm going to imagine that there's a current flowing this direction down this branch here called I prime. And remember that I prime is the same as the current flowing through RC because we're assuming that no current is flowing here when we're computing the Thevenin equivalent. So I can use a current divider rule. I'll sum up all of these resistances and stick that in the denominator. Again, I'm putting parentheses here, even though I don't technically need them to help keep track of things. I have two branches. One branch is this RC plus R1 branch, and the other is the R2 branch. And when I'm using a current divider rule, I want to use the resistance of the branch that the current's not flowing down, at least I should say in terms of the current that I'm analyzing, the current that I'm trying to compute. I want to compute this I prime current, so I put the resistance associated with the opposite branch, R2, in the numerator here. So that computation gives me the current I prime. But what I want to know is what is the voltage associated with that? Well, that current I prime is flowing down this resistor RC. So to figure out the effect of the voltage here, I just multiply that current I prime by RC according to Ohm's law. Now, is there a plus or minus here? Well, obviously there's a minus there because I wrote a minus there. But the reason we can figure out that there's a minus here is this current source is essentially pulling current out of the node. So that's going to lower the voltage, so we put a minus sign here. If the current source makes an arrow that's pointing into the node, you put a plus sign there. Okay, so what about the Thevenin resistance looking out of the collector? Well, that's pretty easy to compute. I'll just have RC in parallel with R1 plus R2. Because remember when we're computing a Thevenin resistance, we zero out the independent sources. So this would look like ground, and this is disconnected entirely here. To zero a current source, you make it an open circuit. So you can then take those various quantities, plug them into these expressions, and make sure you get a number that's positive. Now, I don't know of any other textbooks or instructors that really lean into using Thevenin equivalents with superposition to solve these kinds of bias problems the way Marshall Leach did. If you have seen this elsewhere, let me know in the comments below. The main thing I want to point out right now is there's another interesting example in his notes here on the BJT bias equation. So example one here is the resistor divider bias that we looked at last time. Example two here is this collector feedback kind of bias scheme that I just went through, although in his write-up he just gives the answer without explaining it. And there's an example three here, which is a bias scheme that is not very practical. I can't think of any reason anyone would actually do this. I think this is presented just as an exercise in the technique. So I would encourage you to go to Marshall's 3050 website, 3050 is the older number for what's now called 3400, and see if you can derive his results.